Peter warns us to be alert against false teachers. He says, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. There is no place for maybe or perhaps in Peter's words. Peter makes a clear and definite statement. There were false prophets among the people of Israel in the Old Testament. That's a matter of history. It's clearly stated in Scripture. There's no argument about this. False prophets were a constant problem in the Old Testament. And those who falsely claimed to be prophets of God were supposed to be stoned. But the people rarely had the will to deal with them, and so they multiplied, causing disaster to the spiritual life of God's people. In the same direct way, Peter says, there will be false prophets among you. Did you notice where the false teachers will be? Peter says that they will be among you. The you that Peter is writing to is the church. Peter is not writing to politicians or lawyers. He is writing to neither self-help gurus nor consultants. Peter is not talking about the leaders of the economy or about scientists. He's not warning you about New Age people that appear on television with wild and wacky ideas. Peter's talking about us, the people in the local church. Peter is talking about us, members of a local congregation. The church is the body of Christ on earth, and it's called the bride of Christ. The word church in the Bible comes from the Greek word, ecclesia, which means to be a called out company or an assembly. So the church is any gathering of imperfect people who know they need Jesus as their savior. The church is people who gather to work together to build relationships, to help those in need, to glorify God by striving to be like Christ and to share his love with others. The church is a hospital where sick and hurt people go to find spiritual healing. There's no such thing as a pure church this side of heaven. You'll never find it. The wheat and the tares grow together. The real exists alongside the counterfeit and it's hard to distinguish between them. Most of the time, the false teachers in a local church are not deliberately teaching falsehoods. The false teachers are us. We might misunderstand a verse, or we may take something out of context. We don't want to be false teachers, but we're imperfect. There is one, one being who is a true and perfect false teacher. He's the one we call Satan. Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, it says, For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your feet on a stone. 
Isn't this an encouraging verse? When we're feeling under attack or we're feeling in danger? The Bible is the living, inspired word of God. This verse is true. But it can be used to deceive. The enemy of the church is Satan. Satan is the counterfeiter. Satan has a false gospel preached by false ministers producing false Christians. Satan plants his counterfeits wherever God plants true believers. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was in conflict with the powers of darkness. And it's the clear teaching of the apostles, Peter, James, John, and Paul, that Satan is against the church. And he must be resisted by faith and by the word of God. Satan does not always try to ruin faith by saying, the Bible isn't true. He often tries to destroy our faith by affirming some passage and using it to lead us into disobedience. Satan quotes the Bible to use it against us. Satan quoted these beautiful words of Psalm 91 in an effort to get Jesus to jump off the roof of the temple in Jerusalem. Do you remember how? In Matthew chapter 4, Satan said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you. All Christians drink life from God's holy word. We die without it. We will not let it be taken from us. We will go to jail rather than stop reading it. So what does Satan do? His one aim is to destroy our faith. The word of God keeps faith alive. We cling to it, and Satan cannot tear it away from us. So, he studies the Bible. How else could he quote Psalm 91 to Jesus? Satan studies it. And he especially studies how to distort it. And how to pervert it by plausible misinterpretations. Yes, of course, they must be plausible. Satan is not pleased when his evil sub-demons put absurd misinterpretations into our heads because they're far too easily corrected. Proverbs 15, verse 6 says, There is treasure in the house of the godly. Satan wants you to believe that this verse justifies the accumulation of personal wealth in a world of poverty and hunger. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Satan wants you to believe it means we should not help others and we should not give to charity. Romans chapter 9 and verse 16 says, So, it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. Satan wants you to think that this means we don't need to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a sobering thought that the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Yes. And indeed it is. What did Jesus say when Satan quoted scripture? 
Jesus said, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Matthew 4, 7. He quoted scripture against Satan's use of scripture. He knew the Bible better than Satan. We also are able to know the Bible better than Satan. Not because we're smarter than Satan. Satan has been studying the Bible since it was written. He was present for all of the events that the Bible records. We don't defeat Satan by our intellect. We win when we know and we understand the author of the Bible. We understand the heart of God. We understand his purposes in a way that Satan never can. For Satan, the words of Scripture are dead. But because of the Holy Spirit, because of the Holy Spirit, they are alive for us. Satan has no concept of grace, no concept of mercy. Satan cannot understand sacrificial love. God's heart, God's purposes are a complete mystery to Satan. But not to God's children, not to us. Just because I'm quoting scripture does not mean that I am making correct application of the words of God. Do not believe everyone who can quote you a text of scripture. History is strewn with cults who twisted scripture to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16 Peter's plain statement reminds us that the church needs to be protected. Among the wind of the many wonderful people who come through the doors of the church each year, some will do more harm than good. They may seem the nicest of people, but perhaps they do not believe in the authority of the Bible or the exclusivity of the salvation in Christ. We always welcome such people, because they need Christ just as much as we need Christ. But crucially, we must not allow them to have influence in the church. Septic skeptics will always be able to point to hypocrisy and inconsistency in the church. They've always done it. They always will do it. To my mind, one of the strangest reasons for not following Christ goes like this. I've seen people in the church who are hypocrites. So, will you not follow Christ because some people who claim to do so are hypocrites? The existence of a counterfeit is never a good reason for rejecting the genuine. Peter essentially tells us, of course there are counterfeit Christians. Of course there are teachers who do the church more harm than good. What else would you expect in this fallen world? Grow up. Don't be naive. Don't miss what's real simply because you've seen the counterfeit. What we can do, all of us, is make sure we get to know our Heavenly Father deeply. We can read widely in the Bible and ask continually how this part fits with that part, and that part with this part. And when the pieces start to fit together, 
we are more secure from the distortions. We can read theological books that the decades and the centuries have proven to be deep, solid, lasting. We can fast, we can pray that God will open our eyes to see true and wonderful things in his word. And we can obey what we understand so that we will understand more. Amen.